Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And I see there's still people coming in. So we'll, we'll do a little intro here. Um, I'm Katie from Adult Services at the Crystal Lake Public Library. And we are lucky enough to have Sarah McHale here from the Land Conservancy of McHenry County. And she is going to be sharing with us um, pollinator friendly garden cleanup and how to do that for the fall, which um, I know I, I personally have a family member that's very excited about this. So I know everybody's super pumped. Um, a couple of updates from the library. If you are a Crystal Lake library card holder, um, don't forget that we are offering curbside service right now so you can place your holds online and um, then select a time to come pick them up once they're ready for you and we will bring them out to the curb for you. Um, another exciting thing that will be happening soon, um, limited hours of open, open time for patrons to come into the library and that you'll be hearing more about that soon. That will be starting September 14th. So get excited for that. Um, we'll have more information on that soon. So I'm going to go ahead and turn everything over to Sarah. And um, also let your friends know um, we are recording this. This will be up on our YouTube when we um, are done. So without further ado, here is Sarah. Perfect. Thank you so much, Katie, for having me tonight. Um, yes, my name is Sarah McHale. I am the Community Engagement Specialist with the Land Conservancy of McHenry County. Um, a little background on me, my degree is in ecology, my professional background is in environmental education, and um, I love gardening with native plants and doing restoration on my own property and then teaching other people how to do these things as well. And so I'm lucky enough to have a job where I get to do that kind of stuff. Um, the Land Conservancy of McHenry County, we are a nonprofit land trust and located here in McHenry County, our office is in Woodstock. Um, we've been around since 1991 and a land trust, it, what we like to do is work with private landowners um, who want to preserve and take care of, of their land. And that can take a variety of forms. It could be just through education programs like this. It could be through one of our um, site visit programs. So a program that includes me coming over and doing a personal site consult on your property. So our conservation at home program, um, we do that for oak keepers and 5,000 acres challenge and a whole variety of things. All of this information is on our website as well, conservemc.org. Um, we work with landowners who want to put conservation easements on their property, which is basically a way of preserving your land forever, even after you no longer live there. Um, and there's a whole variety of ways that we work with those landowners. Um, we do a farmland preservation program. We have a native tree, shrub, and plant sale going on right now, actually, on our website. You can pre-order stuff and then pick it up in the middle of September. Um, and we do that in the spring, too. So we've got, oh, oh, and we have, we preserve and take care of land ourselves as well. So sometimes we'll fundraise and actually preserve smaller parcels of land um, that are ecologically um, significant in some way. So through all of these things that we do, because there's only like eight or nine of us that work for the Land Conservancy, we really depend a lot on our volunteers and on member support. So anybody who's interested in becoming a member or learning more about us, just go to our website. Now, if you're not here in McHenry County, I highly suggest you find your local land trust. Um, and you literally just go to a website called findalandtrust.org and type your zip code in and you're going to be connected with your local land trust and find out what programs they're offering and how you can become involved or volunteer or get on their e-newsletter list or whatever. 
Okay, if you have questions tonight, put them in the Q&A box. Um, I will go through that at the end, okay? And you can be typing them in there at any time. At the very end, I'll go through all of it. Um, my email address is also going to be on the very last slide, so you can always contact me with questions too. Okay, so let's start the program. Enough of me talking about that stuff. Um, tonight, we are going to be talking about this part of the pollinator life cycle that people oftentimes forget about. We hear so much about how to support pollinators during the spring and the summer with the plants that you're supposed to put in your yard, right? Everybody's heard about putting native plants in to give nectar and pollen to our, our pollinators and put milkweed in so the modern caterpillars have something to eat. And those are super important things that, that you need to do during the spring and the summer. But then there's this whole other part of the year, the fall and the winter. And what are these insects doing, you know? And what are, what are birds doing during those times of the year as well? And how can we support them? Um, because not all insects, not all birds are going on these long, you know, migratory journeys. A lot of them are staying here. And what you do in your yard can help support them. And lucky for you, there's really just a few extremely simple, free <laughs> things that you can do that are going to make a really big impact, okay? Um, so it's going to really come down to leaves and dead stems. So a lot of people take those things and they cart them away to the curb. Don't throw that stuff away, okay? You've worked really hard and I'm going to go through, I'm going to go through all this, but you've worked really hard to support these insects and birds and other things, all right? Um, and the cool thing is you're going to be able to support these creatures um, at a variety of stages of their life cycles. Um, it would be impossible for me to cover all the different kinds of insects that spend the winter here in some form of their life, whether it's as an egg or as a larva, um, which is kind of like caterpillar, or as a cocoon. There's just just too many of them. So luckily these um, things I'm gonna tell you about, these steps to take tonight, they help all of them, all right? So you don't even have to totally know <laughs> what it's helping. Okay, and that picture in the left there, you can, I'm gonna talk about this more. You can see how some of the little chrysalises and cocoons, those are chrysalises and cocoon, cocoons, they just look like dead leaves. They're just totally camouflaged. So. All right, let's talk about this here. Come oh, on. I'm trying to get it. I'm having problems advancing my screen. There we go. Okay. So the first thing that we're going to talk about are leaves. Leaves are an invaluable part of your landscape that so many people bag up and put out at the curb for the city to take away. I am one of those weird people who are taking your bags of leaves <laughs> and using them in my yard, okay? So leaves can be a really good thing even on your lawn. Now leaves in a very thin layer can act as a free compost on your lawn. Obviously, they're not great for your lawn if they form thick mats, but as a thin layer on your lawn, we recommend that you leave them there, okay? Um, they add dead organic matter as they break down over the winter, and that actually enriches your soil, which is going to lead to healthier lawn. Um, the rest of the leaves, like let's say you've just got too many and they're forming thick mats, we recommend that you just rake them into a garden bed and leave them in your garden bed or um, some other unmowed area 
and leave them whole. Okay, let's talk about this. Now, a lot of times people um, get really nervous that if they have a lot of leaves in their garden, their perennial garden beds, or even their vegetable garden beds, that they're gonna smother new growth come next fall. And I'm telling you with native plants, that's not gonna be the case. And even with a lot of non-native plants, like daffodils and tulips and stuff, they come up through that leaf litter, no problem. Now, what scientists who study this stuff have found is that um, in order to best mimic the woodland ecosystem, it's best to have at least a two inch layer of leaves in your garden beds. Okay, so at least two inches is going to best replicate what you find when you're walking around in a healthy like oak woodland. Okay, again, adding invaluable organic matter to the soil, which is going to be actually encouraging our native wildflowers to come up next spring and the native grasses and the ferns and the sedges and all of that. All right. Um, this is a picture here that's showing bloodroot, which is a beautiful native spring wildflower, um, poking up through a thick layer of oak leaves. I can't tell you how many times I've been walking through the woods in early spring and I see some of these little wildflowers actually busting through, like making a hole in some of these leaves that are so broken down by that point that it's really not suppressing any growth, okay? So it's good to have a thick layer of leaves in your gardens. The other advantage to thick layers of leaves is that they actually act like a sponge and help absorb rainwater. So it's really kind of a cool thing. Um, imagine it raining. Imagine just the thick mat of leaves absorbing that rainwater and they, they kind of hold on and trap some of it. And then it stops raining. And eventually they're slowly releasing a lot of that water on kind of like a time release schedule, keeping your plants and trees and shrubs hydrated longer than if the rain just hit bare soil and had nothing to help kind of slow the impact. And they just, the, the rainwater just kind of skims over the surface in that case when it's just bare soil and it's not really um, absorbed as well, okay? So the leaves are also helping absorb rainwater, which is a really cool thing. And let me tell you right now in, in September. It rained for like five minutes here in Crystal Lake at my house today and I was ecstatic. <laughs> it's like, oh, we need the rain. So I'm going to take all the help I can get from the leaf litter that I've got out in my woods and in my garden beds right now. Okay. Now here's the thing about the leaves. It's really important that you don't shred them up, <laughs> that you leave them whole in your garden beds. So there's so many insects that depend on our leaves not being shredded and mulched up at every, like every single stage of their lives, whether it's an egg, a little caterpillar, a, a chrysalis or cocoon, and even the adult. So just one example here is this red banded hair streak, which is a super common butterfly that's found in woodlands, in neighborhoods that have a bunch of trees in them. Um, they lay their eggs on the, on the underside of dead leaves on the ground under a host tree. So if you just have like lawn under all of your trees and you're mowing that lawn, you're shredding up these eggs and the caterpillars too, because the caterpillars are feeding on those dead leaves of their, their host tree as well. So on the oak leaves or sumac leaves as well, all right? 
Um, and it's not just butterflies that are depending on these, these dead leaves. Um, so many different kinds of bumblebees do as well. A lot of our um, bumblebees, the queen bumblebee, who's kind of like the head of the whole hive, um, she overwinters usually burrowed a couple inches under leaf litter. So things like the federally endangered rusty patched bumblebee, which is found here in McHenry County in backyards, um, especially backyards who have native plants, you leave some leaves on the ground over the winter and you could be potentially hosting a federally endangered bumblebee species. Like that's extremely cool, okay? So those leaves are shelter for a lot of different insects. Now here's a great example. Um, if my like picture of me is in your way, you can minimize me or just move me out of the way or whatever. Um, this is a really great example of an insect, a moth, with a cocoon that looks exactly like a leaf. I mean, it's so incredibly camouflaged. These are polyphemus moths. So that upper left-hand picture, that is my hand. I found one of these in one of my gardens that has a million leaves in it. Um, <laughs> that's an approximate number. So that's my hand holding one. You can see how large these moths are, and they're incredibly beautiful. So their host tree, um, they've got a bunch of different hosts. So birches, maples, oaks, hickories, all kinds of things, and some more too. And so what happens is that crazy green caterpillar up in the right there spins its cocoon into a leaf. While the, and that's happening right now, actually. Um, while the leaf is green and hanging on the tree, the caterpillar spins itself into a leaf in a cocoon, all right? And then eventually, over the fall and winter, that leaf with the cocoon in it drops onto the ground, all right? And it just overwinters on the ground like that. So if you think about the trees in your yard, if it's just surrounded by lawn grass and then comes spring, you just go through there with the mower, you're gonna mulch, you're gonna just kind of chop that stuff all up. So if you can gently rake these things into garden beds off of your lawn and they're gonna be fine, they're gonna flourish or have garden beds under some of your trees too, which is, very convenient for mowing when you don't have to mow close around trees, okay? So then the next summer, um, the adult, that moth you see there, will emerge and from its cocoon, and then it mates and dies within a week. So they're only that big, beautiful moth form, adult moth form, for a week. They don't eat they don't do anything during that week other than mate and then the females lay eggs and the whole thing starts all over again okay okay so moving on from leaves the other thing you can do that's super important are your plant stems so again this is like this completely free thing that requires no work from you <laughs> and is already there in your gardens, all right? So ideally, you're just gonna let your plants stay standing over the winter, okay? That's feeding a bunch of birds, and the seeds are, and um, it's also feeding various insects, but what's really happening, mainly happening, is inside the stems, you're getting a ton of different kinds of tiny little native bees that are overwintering inside various kinds of stems. Um, so you can see the picture on the right with that little bee head sticking out there. And then the picture on the left is a, if this is so cool, that is a leaf cutter bee um, nest entrance 
where they, those little leaf cutter bees, they literally just cut out these perfectly tiny circular little pieces from certain kinds of leaves and then they will seal the hole to their nest in the dead stem with that tiny little perfect piece of leaf and they will overwinter inside that dead stem okay um it's really neat so you don't even have to do anything <laughs> and they've got a home all right so the plants with what are known as pithy centers whatever that's just like centers of plants that are easy to be excavated out for these insects with their little mandibles or their little jaws plants like goldenrods and coreopsis and asters and coneflowers and shrubs like elderberries and dwarf bush honeysuckle dwarf bush honeysuckle is a native honeysuckle um well it's not a true honeysuckle but um that is a fantastic native shrub as well for like foundation plantings and whatever okay that's a whole different program but <laughs> bees love they love a lot of those kinds of um, plants as well and some of those we're selling in our native tree shrub and plant sale right now okay so another thing oh so let's say you have some plant stems in a certain location that like aesthetically you're just not okay with leaving them standing the whole winter and into next spring fine that's cool cut them down but leave them at least 15 inches tall now there's some disadvantages to cutting them at all because you're cutting off the seed heads and then the birds aren't able to eat the seeds but if you have to cut them, cut them 15 inches. Research has shown that a lot of these little native bees are nesting within the first 15 inches from the ground, then 15 inches up. That's where they're overwintering is inside the stem. Um, this is a picture from Lori Garden in Chicago, which is an amazing, it's mainly a native plant garden. It's whatever. It's not 100% native plants, but you know, they, they did what they did. It's wonderful to visit. Um, and they have started not cutting down all dead stems to support pollinators. And that's a really big deal in a formally designed manicured urban space. Um, to kind of buck the horticultural tradition of cleaning your gardens, right? And to leave these stems. And what I've seen, when I've seen this done in both formal gardens and informal gardens, is when all of these stems are cut at the same height, they're all cut, whatever, 15 to 18 inches tall, it doesn't look sloppy at all it doesn't look messy so even in your formal gardens um you can still maintain that look and be ecologically helpful as well um, and i'm really glad and to see the city of chicago kind of setting that example for so many visitors that go there every year Okay, now this is an example of that pithy center that I was talking about. This is a way that you can know if your stem is being used by one of these extremely tiny little native bees. It looks like sawdust, right? That's been excavated from the stem. So you just, you look for that. And that's a clue that, um, that your stem is being used. And that's super exciting, okay? So, Next spring and summer is when that little bee will emerge out of that stem. And here is another thing to look for, and that's bee butts <laughs> or abdomens. Um, a lot of times that's, that's what you'll see is when they're hanging out up on the top, you'll kind of see them as they're going down into their stem. And that's a little carpenter bee that's doing that there. Um, these photographs, this one in the slide before, they were taken by Heather Holm, who, oh, do I have the book? 
I mean, no, I don't, but it's on the resource page at the end. Heather Holm has two amazing books on pollinators and they're on the, they're on the thing at the end, but she also has an amazing Facebook page too. So if you just Google her name and also like one of her book title names on Facebook and Instagram too, and you follow her, you're going to learn so much about pollinators. She, her photography is amazing. She's out of Minnesota. Um, she's got a graphic design background and a photography background as well as years and years of research on entomology. And she's got garden design background too. So anyway, she's fantastic resource to follow. Okay. Okay. So then I kind of mentioned this, um, but these plants over the winter are also going to be huge supporters for birds. And I'm already starting to see this right now as some plants are starting to go to seed. These goldfinches <laughs> are going to town, okay? So they're, they're so small, they can perch right on top of a lot of the flower heads and the seed heads and just pluck those seeds right out. Um, some of these seeds are gonna fall on the ground as well. And they're gonna become new plants or there's tons of little ground um, birds who scratch around on the ground over the winter, like juncos, who are going to eat those seeds as well. There's also some plants, like goldenrods, which is what you see on the lower right there, that form something called a gall. There are so many different kinds of galls. This is just one example of a gall, but what happens is like, some kind of insect, like say a fly or a wasp or something, lays an egg on the host plant's stem. So in this case, this goldenrod. That causes a chemical reaction in the plant to swell and grow into that like ball-shaped formation. And then the egg is protected inside that formation. And metamorphosis, occurs. So the egg turns into a little larva, which is like a white worm looking thing. If any of you fish, it looks like a little wax worm. Um, and then that larva spends the winter inside that gall. And then come spring or summer, it turns into an adult insect, whatever it is, fly, wasp, whatever and it chews its way out of the gall and you'll see a tiny exit hole in like the spring or summer. And it's gonna be like a super perfect, neat, tiny circle, okay? Now, over the winter, if you see a hole in it that's not super perfect with clean edges and it's more ripped up, that's from woodpeckers who peck into these galls and eat the larva. And those are protein packed little bundles of energy for those woodpeckers to eat during a lean part of the year during winter, okay? A lot of fishermen will cut these gulls open too and use those little larvae as bait. So again, standing plants, hugely beneficial to so many different kinds of wildlife. All right, so another thing that a lot of times people don't think about is the benefit of dead wood and rocks and snags. So snags are just like dead standing trees. Again, there's so many different kinds of insects that are going to use these. So on the left, on the left, we're going to start seeing woolly bear caterpillars. If you look at the arrow, you can see like the little kind of brown uh, stripe. They're like the black and brown and black striped, super fuzzy looking caterpillars that we're all going to see start kind of like crossing trails and sidewalks as they're trying to get to an area to spend the fall and winter. So they love to overwinter inside or underneath dead wood um, and under leaves and stuff like that. So leaving sections of dead wood in your garden, for one thing, decoratively, it can look really cool. 
but ecologically you're going to house so many really valuable kinds of insects. So that little woolly bear caterpillar is going to turn into that yellow Isabella tiger moth that you see down there come next spring or next summer. Um, there are also, again, more little bees who will nest um, in abandoned beetle holes in dead wood. So we've all seen that in like dead wood laying on the ground out in the woods where there's all those cool like tracing marks and stuff um, that kind of like go all over in the exposed dead wood. And then sometimes there will be little boring holes. Oftentimes those are from beetle larva, which is just like the little white worm looking thing. Um, well, once those holes are abandoned, these so many different kinds of insects are going to use those holes, like this little green sweat bee, and they're just iridescent and super beautiful. So they will nest and overwinter as well inside those little holes in dead wood. And rocks, the same thing happens, especially rocks that have like crags and stuff in them. You're going to get all kinds of little insects, especially under those rocks. So having some nice decorative flagstone or whatever, a nice, you know, rock as a part of your garden isn't just going to look nice and give your garden some kind of structure. Um, it's going to be a home as well. So there's a couple more things. Um, and this one isn't quite as obvious. Minimizing ground disturbance over the winter. So this is mainly for people who are going to start transplanting perennials in the fall. So try to minimize the disturbance to minimize disturbing underground bee nests. So a lot of our native bees, like 70% of our native bees actually nest underground, all right? And that's so many different kinds of species. And when you dig and you're digging deeper than like six inches, you run into the danger of disturbing their underground uh, nesting sites, okay? So what I like to tell people to do is if you notice, see on the right there where um, there's tiny little holes that looks like disturbed little granules of, it looks like sand, but it's actually soil around those little holes. That's from little bees that have excavated those holes out. And I see this all the time in my gardens when I'm weeding in there. Um, I see these tiny little holes. And so what you can do if you notice a congregation of those holes, you can like stick a flag or a stick or something next to that and then come fall, make sure you don't disturb that. Don't move perennials out of that area. Just leave it alone, you know, and go somewhere where you're not seeing all those little holes. Um, the other thing to think about is if you're removing trees or shrubs, do it in a way that's creating the least amount of soil disturbance as possible. And the way to do that is just by cutting it at the base. So with a chainsaw or loppers, as opposed to tying a chain around it and ripping it out of the ground or using what's called a weed wrench, which is like basically a big lever thing to pry the entire tree out of the ground, dislodging the entire root system creating a giant crater in the ground, not only is that just making a big mess and setting you up for like a million weeds to grow there come next spring, but it's also potentially disturbing some of these nesting sites for various insects. So just cut it at the base, okay? Um, I say use the cut stem treatment. That's because we usually tell people to like dab an herbicide on the cut stumps so that they don't re-sprout back. That herbicide is not going to translocate down into the soil. It's going to stay in the stump and the root 
and it is not going to have a harmful effect on insects that are nesting underground nearby. Okay, so um, some people might be conducting prescribed burns in their properties um, in the fall or could be over the winter if it's dry enough or even next spring. So something to think about doing is if you're going to do that is to either don't burn the same spot every single year or burn sections of your woods or your prairie or whatever it is or your garden. I burn my gardens too. Um, burning is really, really good for plant diversity, which then means that it's going to be really good for insects as well. Because when we have lots of different kinds of plants, native plants growing, we're going to support lots of different kinds of insects. So burning in the long term is a good thing for insects. If you just do a few of these little ideas, it's going to minimize the short-term impact on the insect population. Because obviously fire, I just talked to you about all of, all of these cocoons and larvae and everything else are, are in that leaf litter. So fire that affects the first inch or two of that leaf litter, yeah, it's going to harm those insects, okay? but it's not going to harm the insects that are actually down underneath the ground. So to minimize your impact on the insects that are in the leaf litter, don't burn the same section every year. Just do like every other year. Um, or just burn like half or a quarter of a section and just rotate that, you know, every year. Okay, I'm gonna do the Northwest section this year. Next year, I'm gonna do the Southeast section. And, then you're keeping these little insect populations intact, enough for them to reproduce and be okay. And the thing that I want you guys to understand about these burns, and the reason I put this picture in here, that is my son sitting, <laughs> sitting right next to fire, um, is to show you how patchy and not hot these little woodland burns actually are with this leaf litter. I mean, he's sitting in that area that just burned. It's really not that hot at all. And when you do this, when you do burn an area, oftentimes there's large sections that don't even burn at all. The fire, whatever, maybe it's too wet right there. Who knows what it is, but the fire just kind of goes around it. Um, so don't ever not burn because you're worried that you're gonna harm the insects. The long-term benefits greatly outweigh um, the short-term losses that you're going to sustain. And we give a class on how to do prescribed burning for landowners. Um, for those of you that are legally allowed to do it. I mean, obviously, if you're not allowed to do that in your municipality, then you're not going to do that. But a large portion of McHenry County is unincorporated. And you are allowed to do that. I mean, I live in an unincorporated Crystal Lake and I'm able to burn with proper permitting and following proper rules and with proper education, okay? Okay. So we also have a program, and I mentioned this in the beginning, called Conservation at Home, which um, is a list of ideas basically, that you can find on our website um, of ways to incorporate sustainability into your yard. It's basically put some native plants in your yard and take some invasive stuff out as it works for you, okay? The fee for the program includes a one-year membership to the Land Conservancy, if you're not already a member, um, and all you do is email me and I come over and do a site visit with you and we walk your property. I answer your questions. I give you suggestions. I teach you how to identify different things. I've helped people with garden design, with oak woodland restoration, all kinds of stuff. We've been doing this program for five years now. Um, we've, we're reaching a couple hundred 
properties that are participating. It's probably even more than that now. I don't know, I haven't counted in a while. Um, so it's a great way to kind of talk to your friends and family about using native plants in your property and what that can do to support pollinators um, year round on your property. Because um, if you meet a certain number of the little criteria from the checklist, basically if you've got native plants in your property, you're gonna qualify for certification and then you receive this sign, which is a really great way to talk to friends and family, UPS guy, whoever, <laughs> about doing this kind of stuff in your yard. And then we've got some of my favorite resources for how to learn more about this kind of stuff. I mean, the good thing about supporting pollinators over the fall and winter is it's very simple. It comes down to you actually doing less work, <laughs> leaving your leaves, or gently moving them into a garden bed area or unmowed area and leaving your plant stems up. Though, you know, those are the main things. Minimizing ground disturbance, you know, burning in a smart way. All of those things are super simple to do, honestly. And then some of my favorite resources for learning more about pollinators are listed here. So I referred to Heather Holm already. I used some of her photography in this presentation. She's absolutely amazing. I have both of those books, that bees book and that pollinators of native plants. I can't say enough about them. I refer to them all the time. That Pollinators of Native Plants books also includes garden designs at the very end, which is just super valuable. A lot of them are really residentially appropriate garden designs. So if you live in a regular neighborhood, um, she's got just beautiful garden designs that include plants that are really short, okay, um, but are still going to be ecologically significant plants. Um, Doug Tallamy, if you guys haven't heard of Doug Tallamy, just Google his name right now. <laughs> he, he is an entomology professor, I think out of University of Delaware, maybe, um, who wrote his first book, Bringing Nature Home. Oh, look, I have it right here. He wrote that back in 2007, I think. This explains the link between native plants trees and shrubs and insects in backyards in a way that nobody had really done before. Um, yeah, he's a professor, but let me tell you, he explains this stuff in a way that is so incredibly easy for people to understand. And then Nature's Best Hope is his book that was just released, I don't know, in the last year or so maybe. And it's super inspirational about um, cutting down on the amount of lawn that we have and turning that into productive native habitat. And I have a whole webinar available on our website for download on how to convert lawn to like native wildflower habitat. Um, Illinois Wildflowers, great website that has for every single plant, tree or shrub, a section called faunal associations. So that's like every insect that is known to depend on that plant. So if you Google like burr oak, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll Google burr oak and then the word Illinois after that, one of the search results is going to be this website, Illinois Wildflowers. And you're gonna be able to read about all the insects that depend on that particular species. And that is super, um, inspirational to learn about and to know that these things that you're putting in your yard are supporting so much life year-round. Um, Xerces Society, just go to their website. They've got a million different <laughs> amazing flyers and brochures that you could download and learn about and so follow them on Facebook or whatever, the whole thing. And then bug guide is a great one for ID of pollinators. And so it actually is the iNaturalist app, which is a free app uh, that you can download on your phone. 
And there's like a million different plant and bug kind of ID apps. iNaturalist is the best one that I have found. Um, it's not always right, but out of all the apps, we found this one to be the most accurate. So that's a really good one to download. So with that, I am going to go through the Q&A box and start see if there's any questions. And it looks like there are. So if you think of questions, go ahead and stick them in the Q&A box right now. And then I think Katie said they're going to check the chat too. So she'll jump in if there's any questions in the chat as well. But it looks like for what are your recommendations for people who live within an HOA? I live in a neighborhood with an HOA um, where landscape services are universal and where they have little control over the cleanup process. Okay, so this is a tough situation. It is going to require you to um, do some education and some ad advocacy, basically talking to your HOA board as well as your landscape company um, to encourage them to uh, move those leaves into garden beds whenever possible um, and to leave plant stems standing at least 15 inches tall. If they are like, if the HOA is freaking out and is requiring <laughs> that all plant stems, you know, that they're cut down, talk to your HOA and give the example of Lurie Garden in downtown Chicago, in Millennium Park, okay, designed by Piet Oldolf, like an internationally known garden designer. They're leaving those stems standing, okay? So encourage them to work with the landscape company to be like, just leave the stem stand in 15 inches. It's no more work. You know, it really isn't a big deal. They're gonna be moving those leaves. They're going to be doing something to those plant stems anyway. So it's gonna take some advocacy and some education on your part. Just so you guys know, I do presentations for HOAs, um, especially if it's requested by one of our members. I do those kinds of educational presentations for any for any of those interested groups like neighborhood groups and that kind of stuff. Okay, so I would recommend you become a member if you're interested in inviting me to do a presentation like that to help advocate on your behalf. All right, if you have no actual lawn, would you use the two inch thick leaf litter recommendation? Um. It doesn't have to necessarily be two inches of leaves. It can be dead plant material in general. So leaving dead stems on the ground. Oh, that's something I didn't mention. If you do end up cutting your plant stems, you can leave those dead plant stems on the ground. <laughs> I mean, that's free organic material right there. Like, why would you not leave those there? And I've done this where in my formal gardens, front yard, neighborhood with an HOA, I just laid them in very neat little bundles on the ground in my gardens. And it looks fine and they break down over the winter. So it doesn't necessarily have to be two inches of leaves. Leaves do end up benefiting, um, again, a lot of those pollinators that are using tree leaves, like think back to that polyphemus moth who's literally going to be in a cocoon in a leaf that then drops down onto the ground. Um, but your stems are gonna be really important too, okay? So you don't necessarily have to be like transporting leaves into your gardens. Um, if you've got plenty of other organic material there already, okay? Save those leaves for areas that maybe don't have a bunch of those already existing plant stems and stuff. Okay. Try to avoid bare soil over the winter though, if you can. So if you've got areas of bare soil, throw some leaves on top of that. Okay, alternate, alternately, for those who can leave their leaves on the ground, what is the deepest you recommend leaves to be piled on top of native plants? 
All right, so I don't have data for that. I've looked for that answer. I haven't found it. I don't know for sure. But I can tell you anecdotally what I've seen out in the woods, and it's pretty darn deep. Um, and it, the depth is going to vary between fall and then the following spring. Those leaves are really going to massively compress. So what six inches of leaves in the fall come next spring is going to be an inch or something. It's really going to be compressed down, okay? So for me, I don't have an exact answer for that. I would just kind of use common sense and and look at it i i don't know you know maybe six inches it's really kind of a guess at that point of what is the maximum that's a great question if anybody has like read a study on that just throw it in here and let me know <laughs> but i've looked for that one um do you always burn in the fall tim asked that no no fall you can i mean you can literally burn whenever it's dry enough but fall, winter, or very early spring. So become, before a lot of the insects and reptiles and amphibians become active, that's a great time to burn. So the latest that I'm comfortable with burning is usually the very beginning of April in the spring. And then we'll usually start burning like, from a restoration perspective at the Land Conservancy, we'll start burning in like middle of October or something. All right, and then any time in between there where it's dry enough, like last year we did like a New Year's Eve burn or New Year's Day or something, because it was dry enough, so we were able to get a burn in, okay? Um, let's see, bark chips or no bark chips? So glad you asked this. Um, amending soil recommendations to be pollinator friendly. Okay, no, don't amend your soil. Just don't even mess with it. Plant plants appropriate for your soil type, whether it's clay, whether it's topsoil, whether it's sand and gravel. There are native plants appropriate for that soil type, okay? Um, don't use wood chips. And this is super controversial when I say this. <laughs> this is not something that is like, horticulturally accepting, everywhere you read, they're gonna be like mulch, mulch around your plants. Don't, use leaves, okay? Use leaves around your plants. A, you don't have to pay for it. <laughs> B, it's there. And C, the pollinators are actually gonna use it. Dead wood chips, no. They're not gonna lay their eggs on that. They're not gonna need that as, as like a host plant. Um, it's going to take years for those that wood chip to actually break down and it's not adding much nutrients to your soil and the leaves actually are okay and they're actually going to be a little area where bees can tunnel down and nest inside and you know little insects are going to lay their eggs on them and they are going to benefit your soil don't spend your money on wood mulch, guys. Use some leaves. Okay. Wild Ones Natural Landscaping YouTube. Yes. Yes. Has a great lecture by Doug Tallamy. Yep. Anytime you can find those online lectures by Doug Tallamy, do it. He's, he's great. He's full of tons of awesome information. He's the one that brought that, wrote that book, Bringing Nature Home. It's a great book. Um, I have raised garden beds. Should I put leaves on those? Diane asks. Yeah, absolutely. You, over the winter, don't leave your soil exposed, okay? I mean, this is even nothing to do with pollinators. Put some leaves on there, okay? That's going to break down and enrich that garden soil. That's what you want, especially if it's like a vegetable garden for raised beds the nutrients are being extracted by those vegetables, okay? Depending on what you're growing, tomatoes, gourds, whatever it is, those are heavy feeders. They're taking a lot out. By putting leaves and compost on your raised garden beds, 
um, in the fall is a great time to do that. You're enriching it come next spring, all right? It has time to sit on those raised garden beds all winter and break down beautifully and organically and be ready for you next spring and summer to plant in. Um, Carol asked, do you suggest leaving leaves on lawn as well? So like I said in the very beginning, yes, in an extremely thin layer, okay? Obviously, if you're leaving them on your lawn where they're, they form a thick mat, that's going to kill your lawn, okay? So um, I would leave a thin layer that's literally see-through. So you can actually see your lawn. Yeah, leave that kind of leaf coverage on there and leave the leaves whole, all right? Because then those little pollinators that are eggs on those leaves or cocoons in those leaves, they have a chance to even overwinter in your lawn, all right? Um, can we put a layer of leaves on top of mulch that is already there? Yeah, you can, because eventually that mulch is going to break down. You know, it might take a few years. Personally, I just stopped using wood mulch anywhere on my property because A, I got tired of paying for it. B, I got tired of spreading it. C, the stupid weeds were still totally growing out of it. And it was easier for me to weed without the mulch there. And I just got plants. Plants just cover my gardens and that's what I want, all right? So yeah, you can put some leaves down over mulch now if you want to. Um, that's, that's still beneficial as well because those leaves will still break down, okay? Fantastic questions, everybody. Um, Katie, was there anything in the chat that I missed? Yeah, there's a couple here. I, I hear your doggy. <laughs> He's like, okay, I'm coming yep. in. Um, yep. <laughs> so uh, one question here. If we leave leaves and stems for the winter, when in the spring is it late enough to remove them? Gotcha. Thank you for asking that. Um, Mid-May-ish. I mean, if you can leave them just standing forever, cool. Um, <laughs> Mid-May, though, is usually the cutoff. So, um, and, and cut them 15 inches, okay? Don't completely rip them out of the ground. Cut them 15 inches and then leave those dead stems there. And usually, you know, between May and June, that's when the plant starts growing back anyway. So eventually that little 15 inches of dead stem it's covered by the new plant growth. So you don't even see them anymore anyway. But mid-May is a good time to, if you're gonna start doing that, to start cutting that kind of stuff. Good question. Um, I think you already answered this, but um, the question was, do you do programs to educate public at public libraries? And <laughs> yes, she does. Um, yeah. Do you do programs to educate lawn services and landscapers? And you had mentioned, yes, you do like, you do presentations for um, HOAs. So I'm guessing that's yeah. kind of the same thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, if the lawn service or the landscaping company wants to hear what I have to say, I am 100% on board with working with them. <laughs> um, you know, we work, there's no lands, well, there used to be some landscaping companies that were member organizations of the Land Conservancy and they've kind of changed focus in the last few years. Um, but there's some arborists that we work with like Davy Tree that are excellent. Um, so if any of you know local landscape companies here in McHenry County, that you want to pass my information on to and we could set something up absolutely i would love to work with them because we have a huge shortage of landscapers in this county who are educated on these really simple things and it doesn't mean that they don't care it's really just a matter of once they learn you know then they're like cool we can just leave the plant stems 15 inches it's got to be client driven though, okay? When that consumer demand is there, they're going to start answering that, okay? Let's see, it looks like another one popped up in the Q&A box. Are there any landscape 
properties in McHenry County that you like in terms of um, ecological landscaping? No. <laughs> there's not, there's not. And I know, haha, <laughs> -ha, yeah, yeah. So there, there used to be one and they've kind of changed focus and they're not anymore. So there's some natural area contractors like um, they're not going to like do lawn mowing and that kind of stuff and like lawn treatment, but Blue Stem Ecological is in Marengo. Um, they'll do like larger scale, you know, rain garden installs or woodland restoration. Same with Red Buffalo Nursery in Richmond. They'll do that kind of work, but they're not going to like do your normal garden maintenance and that kind of stuff. So no, as far as like a, a landscaping company in McHenry County, I'm looking for one. <laughs> and, and I kind of, you know, there's a few that I've run across and I vet like, what is their process, you know? And I haven't found one that I'm comfortable with recommending to people. So Shout out to any landscape company that we don't know about yet who's willing <laughs> to do these certain things. Let me know. Um, on that same point, oh, oh my goodness, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was Eva. Um, she, uh, I think same asker, um, might you have a list of talking points I could give my yard service instructing them what to do or not do? So that might be, you might have already answered that. Yeah, it's the, the, the leaves thing, literally just the leaves, like push those leaves into a garden bed or around the trees and the stems, you know, leave those stems 15 inches. That's really all it is. And it's very, it's really, really simple. I mean, there's way more involved when you get into lawn care and organic lawn care and fertilization like that is a whole workshop in and of itself. Um, so I don't have just like a little snippet for, for that because it can involve so much. But as far as this like garden cleanup topic goes from tonight, it's the leaves and it's the stems. Awesome. Uh, another question, when you burn, what are you trying to burn? Leaves on the ground, yeah. grass? Yeah, so I burn um, my native plant gardens and my woods. So I'm not burning my lawn grass. Um, that'll kill your lawn grass. So I'm not burning that. And I do have sections of my yard that are lawn grass. Um, but I have a whole, I've got native gardens and it's burning the um, dead plant material and turning that into ash, which then enriches the soil and it kind of opens it up and allows for new plant growth. I'm not burning the same sections every single year. You know, I'm kind of rotating like when I do stuff. Um, and then in the woods, it's, it's mainly leaves and, and like native grasses and stuff that end up burning. A lot of the like native flowers, the like stalks, a lot of them don't even end up totally burning. They just like stand there and stay upright. Um, it's the grasses and the leaves that end up burning really well. Awesome. This might be our last question. Um, question asks, I assume your education programs at libraries or for landscapers are in McHenry County only, but yeah. you had mentioned that resource at the be uh, towards the beginning of the yeah yeah so yes I work in McHenry County um, I work on a contract basis for groups outside of the county so like if another land trust or another library or group wanted to contract with me there would be a fee for that and I'm happy to do that. Um, this is another question that kind of pertains to this though. Do you think other land trusts would have that neat signage available? Yes, so there are other land trusts who do these kind, same kinds of presentations um, and offer that conservation at home program here in the Chicagoland area and actually all across the state of Illinois. 
um, up into southern Wisconsin, and I think over into southern Michigan too. So if you wanted to know if there's a conservation at home program in your county, just shoot me an email and I can put you in contact with that land trust. Um, I've done that for a bunch of people this year. And if you want to find your land trust, go to findalandtrust.org and type your zip code in. Awesome. Anybody have any last minute questions? Now is the time. But I, that was a great, great group, great questions. And yeah. great thank you. Yes, those were wonderful. All right, Katie, so you're going to send this out to everybody, correct? Yes, all attendees will get emailed the link. And um, if you don't okay. see that email within the next week, just check our YouTube channel. It's just Crystal Lake Public Library on YouTube. And I'll make sure to get you that link right away, Sarah, too, so you guys can share it on your pages. And Perfect. Thank you so much, Katie. And thanks, everybody, for watching tonight. Yes, thank you, everybody. I hope everybody has a great night. And thank you again, Sarah. You're awesome. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Bye.